Hello and welcome to True Crime Case Files. This show deals with violent and often disturbing crimes committed against men, women and children. Some material may not be suitable for all audiences. Therefore, listener discretion is strongly advised. D.B. Cooper gained notoriety after hijacking Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305, a Boeing 727, while it was in United States airspace on November 24, 1971. The hijacking took place during a flight from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. Armed with a bomb, Cooper demanded a ransom of $200,000, the equivalent to $1.4 million in today's currency, and requested four parachutes upon landing in Seattle. After releasing the passengers, Cooper instructed the flight crew to refuel the aircraft for a second flight to Mexico City, with a refueling stop in Reno, Nevada. Approximately 30 minutes after departing from Seattle, Cooper opened the aircraft's rear door, deployed the staircase, and disappeared into the night sky over southwestern Washington. Despite extensive investigations, the hijacker's true identity and fate remain unknown. In 1980, a portion of the ransom money was discovered along the banks of the Columbia River near Vancouver, Washington. Although this finding reignited public interest in the case, it failed to provide any substantial information about Cooper or what happened to him. The remaining money was never recovered. The hijacker initially identified himself as Dan Cooper, but due to a reporter's error, he became known as D.B. Cooper. For 45 years, the Federal Bureau of Investigation diligently pursued the case, accumulating a vast amount of evidence and information. However, no definitive conclusions were reached. The hijacking of Flight 305 remains the only unsolved case of air piracy in commercial aviation history. The FBI speculates that Cooper likely did not survive his daring parachute jump due to adverse weather conditions, inadequate attire and equipment for skydiving, the dense forested area he landed in, his apparent lack of knowledge about the landing site, and the fact that the remaining ransom money was never spent. In July 2016, the FBI officially suspended its active investigation into the case, but the pursuit of Cooper's identity, success and fate continues among journalists, enthusiasts, investigators and amateur sleuths who explore various theories. Cooper's hijacking, along with several copycat incidents the following year, prompted significant enhancements to airport and commercial aviation security measures. Metal detectors were installed at airports, mandatory baggage inspections were implemented, and passengers who purchased tickets with cash on the day of departure underwent additional scrutiny. Boeing 727s were retrofitted with specialized Cooper vanes to prevent the in-flight lowering of the aft staircase. By 1973, the number of aircraft hijackings had significantly decreased, as the improved security measures deterred potential hijackers motivated by financial gain. On the eve of Thanksgiving in 1971, a man named Dan Cooper approached the flight counter of Northwest Orient Airlines at Portland International Airport. He purchased a one-way ticket for Flight 305 to Seattle using cash. Described as a middle-aged white man with dark hair and brown eyes, he was dressed in a black or brown business suit, a white shirt, a thin black tie, a black raincoat and brown shoes. Carrying a briefcase and a brown paper bag, Cooper boarded the Boeing 727-100 aircraft and took seat 18E in the last row. Shortly after takeoff, Cooper handed a note to flight attendant Florence Schaffner, revealing that he had a bomb in his briefcase and demanding her to sit next to him. Schaffner complied and informed the flight crew of the situation. Cooper then conveyed his demands to the captain, which included $200,000 in negotiable American currency and four parachutes. He also requested that the fuel trucks meet the plane upon landing in Seattle and that all passengers remain seated until the money was brought aboard. The captain alerted air traffic control and law enforcement agencies, while the plane circled Puget Sound to provide time for the ransom money and parachutes to be gathered. During the flight, Cooper conversed with flight attendant Tina Mucklow, displaying familiarity with the local area and maintaining a calm demeanor. He mentioned having a grudge, but did not elaborate further. As the plane circled Seattle, an unidentified passenger engaged in a conversation with Cooper, causing a brief disturbance. However, the details of this interaction varied between accounts. Mucklow recalled a different version, where the passenger simply requested a magazine and returned to his seat. Seattle First National Bank provided the requested $200,000 ransom in the form of unmarked $20 bills. 
The money, totaling 10,000 bills, was carefully packaged in a bag weighing approximately 19 pounds. Most of the bills had serial numbers starting with L, indicating that they were issued by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. The FBI took photographs of the money on microfilm as part of their investigation. To fulfill Cooper's demand for parachutes, the Seattle police acquired two front reserve parachutes from a local skydiving school. Additionally, they obtained two back main parachutes from a local stunt pilot. These parachutes were crucial for Cooper's planned escape, although the exact details of his parachute usage and the fate that awaited him remain unknown. At approximately 5.24 Pacific Standard Time, Captain Scott received news that the parachutes had been delivered to the airport and promptly informed Cooper that they would be landing soon. By 5.46, Flight 305 successfully touched down at Seattle-Tacoma Airport. Cooper, with Scott's permission, chose to park the aircraft on a dimly lit runway away from the main terminal. Cooper had a specific request only one representative from the airline was to approach the plane with the parachutes and money, and the only entrance and exit allowed was through the front door using the mobile air stairs. Al Lee, the designated courier from Northwest Orient, was chosen for this task. To avoid any confusion, Lee changed into civilian clothes instead of his airline uniform. With the passengers instructed to remain seated, the ground crew attached the mobile staircase as per Cooper's directive. Mucklow, one of the flight attendants, exited the aircraft through the front door and retrieved the ransom money. She then made her way back to Cooper in the last row, passing the seated passengers with the money bag in hand. Cooper inspected the money while agreeing to release the passengers. In an attempt to lighten the mood, Mucklow jokingly asked if she could keep some of the money. Surprisingly, Cooper agreed and handed her a packet of bills. However, Mucklow promptly returned the money, explaining that accepting gratuities went against company policy. She mentioned that Cooper had previously tried to tip her and the other flight attendants with money from his own pocket, but they had declined due to the policy. Once the passengers had safely disembarked, only Cooper and the six crew members remained on board. Mucklow made three trips outside the aircraft to retrieve the parachutes, bringing them to Cooper in the rear of the plane. During this time, Schaffner, another flight attendant, asked Cooper if she could retrieve her purse from a compartment behind his seat. Cooper granted her request, assuring her, I won't bite you. Hancock, another flight attendant, also asked if they could leave, to which Cooper replied, whatever you girls would like. Hancock and Schaffner then left the aircraft. When Mucklow brought the final parachute to Cooper, she handed him printed instructions for using the parachutes, but Cooper dismissed them, stating that he didn't need them. Unfortunately, there was a delay in the refueling process, leading to the arrival of a second and then a third truck to complete the task. During this delay, Mucklow mentioned that Cooper expressed dissatisfaction with the money being delivered in a cloth bag instead of a knapsack as he had requested. He now had to come up with an improvised method to transport the money. Cooper used a pocket knife to cut the canopy from one of the reserve parachutes and stuff some of the money into the empty parachute bag. An FAA official requested a face-to-face -face meeting with Cooper on the aircraft, but Cooper declined the request. Growing impatient, he urged everyone to speed up, stating, this shouldn't take so long, and let's get this show on the road. Cooper then provided the cockpit crew with his flight plan and specific instructions a southeast course towards Mexico City at the lowest possible airspeed without stalling the aircraft, approximately 100 knots or 115 miles per hour, at a maximum altitude of 10,000 feet. He also insisted that the landing gear remain deployed, the wing flaps be lowered 15 degrees, and the cabin remain unpressurized. First Officer Radixak informed Cooper that this configuration limited the aircraft's range to about 1,000 miles, necessitating a second refueling before entering Mexico. After discussing the options, Cooper and the crew agreed on Reno Tahoe International Airport as the refueling stop. Cooper then instructed that the aircraft take off with a rear exit door open and the air stair extended. Northwest's home office expressed concerns about the safety of this request, but Cooper insisted, saying, It can be done. Do it. He did not argue further and assured them that he would lower the staircase once they were airborne. Cooper also demanded that Mucklow remain aboard to assist with the operation. At approximately 7.40 p.m., Flight 305 took off, carrying only Cooper, Mucklow, Captain Scott, First Officer Radixak, and Flight Engineer Anderson. 
Unexpectedly, two F-106 fighters from McCord Air Force Base and a Lockheed T-33 trainer, diverted from their original Air National Guard mission, began tailing the 727. The three jets maintained a strategic S-flight pattern to stay hidden from Cooper's view and stay behind the slow-moving aircraft. After the plane was airborne, Cooper instructed Mucklow to lower the aft staircase. Filled with fear, she expressed concerns about being sucked out of the aircraft to Cooper and the flight crew. The flight crew suggested that she come to the cockpit and secure herself with an emergency rope. However, Cooper refused, not wanting her or the flight crew to switch positions. Despite her ongoing fear, Mucklow asked Cooper to cut some cord from one of the parachutes to create a safety line for her. Cooper assured her that he would handle lowering the stairs himself and instructed her to go to the cockpit, close the curtain partition between the coach and first-class sections, and not return. Before leaving, Mucklow pleaded with Cooper, urging him to take the bomb with him. Cooper responded, promising to either disarm it or take it along. As Mucklow made her way to the cockpit and turned to close the curtain, she caught a glimpse of Cooper in the aisle, securing what appeared to be the money bag around his waist. Approximately four to five minutes had passed from takeoff to Mucklow's entry into the cockpit. For the remainder of the flight to Reno, Mucklow stayed in the cockpit, becoming the last person to see the hijacker. Around 8 p.m., a warning light in the cockpit alerted the crew that the aft staircase had been deployed. The pilot used the cabin intercom to inquire if Cooper needed any assistance, but his final response consisted of a single word, no. The crew experienced a change in cabin air pressure as a result of the open staircase. At approximately 8.13 p.m., the tail section of the aircraft suddenly pitched upward, forcing the pilots to adjust and stabilize the plane. Co-pilot Bill Radicksack later revealed in his FBI interview that this unexpected pitch occurred while the flight was near the suburbs north of Portland. With the aft cabin door open and the staircase deployed, the flight crew remained in the cockpit, uncertain if Cooper was still on board. Mucklow used the cabin intercom to inform Cooper that they were approaching Reno and requested him to retract the stairs for a safe landing. Despite repeated requests during the final approach, neither Mucklow nor the flight crew received any response from the hijacker. Finally, at 11.02 p.m., Flight 305 touched down at Reno Tahoe International Airport, with the aft staircase still deployed. Law enforcement agencies, including FBI agents, state troopers, sheriff's deputies and Reno police, established a perimeter around the aircraft. However, due to concerns about the potential presence of the hijacker and the bomb, they refrained from approaching the plane. Captain Scott conducted a thorough search of the cabin, confirming that Cooper was no longer on board. After a meticulous 30-minute search, an FBI bomb squad declared the cabin safe. Alongside the discovery of 66 latent fingerprints on the airliner, FBI agents managed to recover several items related to Cooper, including his black clip-on tie, tie clip, and two of the four parachutes. One of the parachutes had been opened and had three shroud lines cut from the canopy. To gather more information, FBI agents conducted interviews with eyewitnesses in Portland, Seattle, and Reno and created a series of composite sketches. Local police and FBI agents wasted no time in questioning potential suspects. In their investigation, Portland police came across a citizen named D.B. Cooper and interviewed him, suspecting that he may have used his real name or the same alias in a previous crime. However, the Portland Cooper was quickly ruled out as a suspect after it was discovered that a reporter named James Long had mistakenly confused the two individuals due to a rushed deadline. This error was then republished by reporter Clyde Jabin, leading to other media sources repeating the mistake. As a result, the hijacker became known as D.B. Cooper. Defining the search area proved to be a challenge due to various factors and uncertainties. The estimated airspeed of the jet varied, and the environmental conditions along the flight path changed depending on the aircraft's location and altitude. Additionally, only Cooper knew how long he had been in free fall before deploying his parachute. The Air Force F-106 pilots did not witness anyone jumping from the airliner, nor did their radar detect a deployed parachute. Furthermore, the darkness of the moonless night and the limited visibility, cloud cover and lack of ground lighting made it difficult to spot a black-clad individual jumping. The T-33 pilots also did not make visual contact with the 727. In an attempt to locate the items Cooper had with him during his jump, 
FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover authorized the use of an Air Force S-71 Blackbird to retrace and photograph Flight 305's flight path. However, poor visibility hampered the photography attempts, rendering them unsuccessful. To gain further insight, FBI agents conducted an experimental recreation using the same aircraft and flight configuration as the hijacking. They pushed a 200-pound sled out of the open-air stair and were able to reproduce the upward motion of the tail section and the brief change in cabin pressure reported by the flight crew at 8.13 p.m. Based on initial extrapolations, Cooper's landing zone was believed to be in the southernmost area of Mount St. Helens, near Lake Merwin. Search efforts focused on Clark and Cowlitz counties, with extensive searches conducted on foot, by helicopter, and even through door-to-door -door searches of local farmhouses. Patrol boats were also deployed along Lake Merwin and Yale Lake. However, neither Cooper nor any of the equipment he carried were found. The FBI coordinated an aerial search along the entire flight path from Seattle to Reno, utilizing fixed-wing aircraft and helicopters. Although broken treetops and objects resembling parachute canopies were sighted and investigated, nothing relevant to the hijacking was discovered. After the spring thaw in 1972, a thorough ground search was conducted by teams of FBI agents, soldiers from Fort Lewis, Air Force personnel, National Guardsmen, and civilian volunteers. This search spanned 18 days in March and another 18 days in April, covering Clark and Cowlitz counties. Additionally, a marine salvage firm used a submarine to search the depths of Lake Merwin. During these operations, the remains of Barbara Ann Derry, a teenage girl who had been abducted and murdered, were discovered in an abandoned structure. However, no significant material evidence related to the hijacking was found. Based on early computer projections, the FBI initially estimated Cooper's drop zone to be between Ariel Dam and the town of Battleground, Washington. However, after a joint investigation with Northwest Orient Airlines and the Air Force, it was determined that Cooper likely jumped over the town of La Senta, Washington. In 2019, the FBI released a report indicating that a burglary had been reported at a small grocery store near Heisen, Washington, approximately three hours after Cooper's jump. This location falls within the calculated drop zone provided by Northwest Airlines to the FBI. The burglar was noted to have taken survival items such as beef jerky and gloves, adding another intriguing piece to the ongoing mystery. One month after the hijacking incident, the FBI took action by distributing lists of the ransom serial numbers to various financial institutions, casinos, racetracks and other businesses that frequently dealt with large cash transactions. They also shared the information with law enforcement agencies worldwide. In an effort to recover the money, Northwest Orient offered a reward of 15% of the retrieved amount, up to a maximum of $25,000. However, the search for the hijacker and the missing funds continued. In early 1972, U.S. Attorney General John N. Mitchell decided to release the serial numbers to the general public. Unfortunately, this move led to an opportunity for two individuals to deceive a Newsweek reporter named Carl Fleming. They used counterfeit $20 bills with Cooper's serial numbers to swindle $30,000 from Fleming, claiming they had an interview with the hijacker. This incident further complicated the investigation. In early 1973, the Oregon Journal republished the serial numbers and offered a reward of $1,000 to anyone who could turn in a ransom bill to the newspaper or any FBI field office. The Post Intelligencer in Seattle made a similar offer with a $5,000 reward. These offers remained valid until Thanksgiving 1974, but despite several reported near matches, no genuine bills were discovered. The search for the missing money seemed to be at a standstill. In 1975, Northwest Orient's insurer, Global Indemnity Company, was ordered by the Minnesota Supreme Court to pay the airline's $180,000 claim on the ransom money. This decision was made as the money remained unrecovered. Further analysis revealed that the initial estimate of the landing zone was incorrect. Captain Scott, who had manually flown the aircraft due to Cooper's demands, determined that the flight path was actually farther east than originally believed. Additional data from various sources, including pilot Tom Bohan from Continental Airlines, indicated that the wind direction used in the drop zone calculations had been wrong, potentially by as much as 80 degrees. This new information suggested that the actual drop zone was located south-southeast of the original estimate in the drainage area of the Washougal River. 
1986, FBI agent Ralph Himmelsbach expressed his belief that if he were to search for Cooper, he would head to the Washougal area. Despite numerous searches conducted in subsequent years, no evidence related to the hijacking has been found in the Washougal Valley or its surroundings. Some investigators speculate that the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens may have destroyed any remaining physical clues. On July 8, 2016, the FBI announced the suspension of the active investigation into the Cooper case. They cited the need to allocate investigative resources and manpower to more pressing matters. However, local field officers would still accept any legitimate physical evidence related to the parachutes or the ransom money that may surface in the future. The extensive 66-volume case file compiled over 45 years of investigation would be preserved for historical purposes at FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. and made available to the public on the FBI website. During their thorough examination of the plane, FBI agents made significant discoveries that directly linked the evidence to Cooper. These findings included a black clip-on necktie, a mother-of-pearl tie clip, a hair from Cooper's headrest, and eight filter-tipped Raleigh cigarette butts from the armrest ashtray. The black clip-on necktie was found in seat 18E, where Cooper had been seated. Attached to the tie was a gold tie clip with a circular mother-of-pearl setting. The FBI determined that this specific tie had been exclusively sold at J.C. Penney department stores, but had been discontinued in 1968. In 2007, the FBI managed to build a partial DNA profile from samples found on Cooper's tie. However, they couldn't establish a direct link between Cooper and the DNA sample. Special Agent Fred Gutt stated that the tie had multiple DNA samples, making it difficult to draw definitive conclusions. The FBI also released previously unreleased evidence, such as Cooper's plane ticket and composite sketches, and requested information about Cooper's identification. In 2009, a group called the Cooper Research Team, or CRT, began reinvestigating the case using advanced technologies that were not available in 1971. The CRT, consisting of experts in various fields, analyzed hundreds of organic and metallic particles found on Cooper's tie. They identified lycopodium spores, which likely originated from a pharmaceutical source. Additionally, they discovered minute particles of unalloyed titanium, bismuth, antimony, cerium, strontium sulfide, aluminum and titanium antimony alloys. These metal and rare earth particles suggested that Cooper may have worked for Boeing or another aeronautical engineering firm, a chemical manufacturing plant, or a metal fabrication and production facility. Hair samples were also found in Cooper's seat. One strand of limb hair was found on the seat, while another strand of brown Caucasian head hair was found on the headrest. The limb hair was deemed unusable due to the lack of unique microscopic characteristics. However, the head hair was preserved for future comparison. Unfortunately, the hair sample was later lost during attempts to build Cooper's DNA profile. Eight Raleigh filter tipped cigarette butts were discovered in the armrest ashtray of seat 18E. The FBI sent these cigarette butts to their crime laboratory to search for fingerprints, but were unsuccessful in finding any. The cigarette butts were then returned to the Las Vegas field office. In 1998, the FBI attempted to extract DNA from the cigarette butts, but discovered that they had been destroyed while in the custody of the Las Vegas field office. The most significant discovery related to the hijacking was the recovery of a portion of the ransom money. In 1980, eight-year-old Brian Ingram found three packets of the ransom cash, totaling around $5,800, while vacationing with his family on the Columbia River. Although the bills had disintegrated from exposure to the elements, they were still bundled in rubber bands. FBI technicians confirmed that the money was indeed a portion of the ransom. The discovery raised more questions than answers, as it was unclear how the bills ended up at Tina Bar. Geological evidence suggested that the bills arrived long after the hijacking, contradicting the hypothesis that they washed freely into the river. Analysis of diadems found on the bills in 2020 further supported the theory that the money entered the water several months after the hijacking. In 1986, the recovered bills were divided between Brian Ingram and Northwest Orient's insurer. Ingram sold 15 of his bills at auction in 2008. These bills remain the only confirmed physical evidence from the hijacking found outside the aircraft. During the hijacking, Cooper demanded and received two main parachutes and two reserve parachutes, the two reserve parachutes were obtained from a local skydiving school, 
while the two main parachutes were supplied by a local pilot named Norman Hayden. Earl Cozzi, the parachute rigger who packed all four parachutes, described the main chutes as emergency bailout chutes rather than the type of parachutes used by skydivers for recreational purposes. He explained that they were designed to open immediately upon pulling the ripcord and were not capable of being steered. When the plane landed in Reno, FBI agents discovered that Cooper had left behind two parachutes, one reserve chute and one main chute. The reserve chute had been opened and three shroud lines had been cut out. However, the main chute left behind was still intact. The FBI agents described the unused main chute as a model NB-6 or Navy Backpack 6, and it is currently on display at the Washington State Historical Society Museum. One of the reserve chutes given to Cooper was actually a non-functional training chute used for classroom demonstrations. It had a sewn-together canopy to simulate the experience of pulling a ripcord without the parachute deploying. This dummy chute was not found in the aircraft when it landed in Reno, leading the FBI to speculate that Cooper may not have been an experienced parachutist, as someone with experience would have recognized the chute as non-functional. However, it was later revealed that neither of the parachute harnesses given to Cooper had the necessary D-rings to attach reserve parachutes. This suggests that Cooper would not have been able to use the dummy chute even if he had recognized it as such. The fate of the dummy chute remains unknown. In 1978, a deer hunter discovered an instruction placard for lowering the aft air stair of a Boeing 727. The placard was found near a logging road east of Castle Rock, Washington, within the flight path of Flight 305. Throughout the 45-year investigation, the FBI released various working hypotheses and tentative conclusions based on witness testimony and limited physical evidence. In the early stages of the investigation, the FBI created composite sketches of Cooper based on eyewitness accounts from the passengers and flight crew. The first sketch, known as Composite A, was released shortly after the hijacking but was not considered an accurate likeness of Cooper. Witnesses described the sketch as showing a young man with a narrow face that did not resemble Cooper's appearance. After receiving feedback, the FBI developed a second composite sketch called Composite B which aimed to depict Cooper's age, skin tone, and face shape more accurately. While this sketch was considered an improvement, some witnesses still felt it portrayed Cooper as angrier or nastier than he appeared. The FBI made further adjustments and improvements, resulting in the final revised Composite B sketch, which was considered the best likeness of Cooper. Flight attendants Florence Schaffner and Tina Mucklow, who had the most interaction with Cooper, provided similar descriptions of him. They described him as around 5 feet 10 inches tall in his mid-40s with short black hair combed back, weighing between 170 to 180 pounds and having a swarthy or olive skin tone. Schaffner mentioned that his eyes were brown. University of Oregon student Bill Mitchell, who sat across from Cooper during the flight, provided descriptions that aligned with those of the flight attendants, with the exception of perceiving Cooper as slightly smaller. Another passenger, Robert Gregory, described Cooper as 5 feet 9 inches tall and believed he had Mexican-American or American Indian heritage. Cooper appeared to be familiar with the Seattle area and may have had military training as he recognized landmarks from the air and accurately commented on the proximity of McCord Air Force Base to the airport. The FBI speculated that Cooper's financial situation was desperate as most individuals who commit large-scale thefts do so out of urgent need. Alternatively, he may have been a thrill-seeker attempting the jump to prove it could be done. In May 1973, the FBI released an eight-page suspect profile. The profile suggested that Cooper was a military-trained parachutist rather than a recreational skydiver, based on his comfort with the provided parachutes and his age, not aligning with the typical skydiving community. They also believed he was physically fit, not a heavy drinker, and displayed intelligence and respect in his interactions. The FBI theorized that Cooper may have taken his alias from a popular Belgian comic series featuring a fictional hero named Dan Cooper, who was known for his parachuting adventures. Overall, the FBI's investigation relied on witness testimony, composite sketches, and behavioral analysis to develop hypotheses about Cooper's identity and background. Based on the evidence and Cooper's tactics, the FBI speculated that Cooper meticulously planned the hijacking and possessed extensive knowledge of aviation, the local terrain, and the capabilities of the Boeing 727 aircraft. 
Cooper strategically chose a seat in the last row of the rear cabin to have a clear view of any actions in front of him and minimize the risk of being approached from behind. This positioning also made him less noticeable to the other passengers. He demanded four parachutes, creating the impression that he might force hostages to jump with him to ensure he would not be supplied with sabotaged equipment. The FBI noted that Cooper's choice of a bomb instead of other weapons used by hijackers prevented any multidirectional attempts to rush him. Cooper took precautions to avoid leaving evidence behind. He insisted that flight attendant Tina Mucklow return any notes written by him or on his behalf, and he even demanded the empty matchbook from his cigarettes. Despite his efforts, he inadvertently left his clip-on tie in his seat. Cooper's familiarity with the Boeing 727's capabilities and confidential features was evident. He specifically chose the aircraft because of its aft air stair and the placement of its three engines, which allowed for a parachute jump to be easily executed. He displayed knowledge of the 727's refueling procedures and specified a 15-degree flap setting, demonstrating his understanding of aviation tactics and the aircraft's capabilities. Cooper also knew about the secret feature of the 727's aft air stair, which could be operated during flight and could not be overridden from the cockpit. This knowledge suggests that Cooper may have been aware of the CIA's use of 727s for covert operations during the Vietnam War. Cooper appeared to be familiar with parachutes, although his level of experience is unknown. He handled the parachutes provided to him with ease and confidence, leading to speculation that he may have been a military parachutist rather than a civilian skydiver. However, some investigators believe that Cooper's knowledge of parachutes could have been acquired through a different role, such as being an Air Force aircraft cargo loader. This position would provide basic jump training and familiarity with parachutes, but not necessarily the expertise needed to safely execute the jump Cooper made. Overall, the evidence suggests that Cooper had extensive knowledge of aviation, the Boeing 727 aircraft and parachutes, indicating careful planning and preparation for the hijack. The FBI's investigation into the fate of Cooper after his jump yielded several reasons and facts that led them to believe he did not survive. These included his apparent lack of skydiving experience, his unfamiliarity with parachutes, the lack of proper equipment for his jump and survival, the inclement weather and low visibility on the night of the hijacking, the wooded terrain he jumped into, his lack of knowledge of the landing area, and the fact that the ransom money was never spent. Cooper's lack of skydiving experience and unfamiliarity with parachutes raised doubts about his ability to safely execute the jump. The FBI believed that an experienced parachutist would not have attempted a jump in the pitch black night, in rainy and windy conditions, wearing inappropriate clothing and footwear. Skydiving experts noted that jumping at night significantly increased the risk of injury, and without proper gear, Cooper would likely have suffered severe injuries upon landing. Furthermore, Cooper did not have the necessary equipment for his jump or survival in the wilderness. He did not bring a helmet, and he jumped into freezing temperatures without proper protection against the wind chill. The contents of the bag he brought on the plane are unknown, but it is speculated that it may have contained essential items such as boots, gloves, and goggles. The fact that Cooper did not use any items from the bag during the hijacking suggested that they were intended for his jump. The FBI also considered the challenging conditions Cooper faced during his jump. The low cloud cover and limited visibility would have made it difficult for him to determine his location, establish a bearing or identify a suitable landing zone. Cooper's lack of knowledge about the area further diminished his chances of a successful landing and escape. The fact that the ransom money was never spent and the recovered portion was found unused also supported the theory that Cooper did not survive. The FBI speculated that Cooper may have become incapacitated from hypothermia during the jump, landed in the Columbia River, and drowned. However, there were differing opinions among FBI agents, with some believing that Cooper may have survived and escaped undetected. Despite the FBI's conclusions, conclusive evidence of Cooper's fate has not been found. The survival of copycat hijackers who attempted similar jumps raised doubts about the initial assessments. The expiration of the statute of limitations for prosecution also made little difference, as there were valid technical grounds to argue that Cooper had forfeited legal immunity. In 1976, a grand jury returned an indictment against John Doe, a.k.a. Dan Cooper, for air piracy and violation of the Hobbs Act, formally initiating prosecution that could be continued if Cooper was apprehended in the future.
From 1971 to 2006, the FBI dealt with over a thousand individuals suspected of serious crimes, including attention seekers and those confessing on their deathbeds. One potential suspect in the infamous D.B. Cooper case is Theodore Burdett Braden Jr., a former Special Forces commander, skydiving expert and convicted felon. Many within the Special Forces community believe that Braden could have been Cooper due to his extensive military background and knowledge of skydiving techniques. Braden had a reputation for taking unnecessary risks and engaging in shady activities to make money. Although he was investigated for various crimes, he was never charged in connection with the Cooper case. Braden's physical description matched some aspects of the eyewitness accounts of Cooper, but there were discrepancies in height. Another individual who was considered a suspect by his brother is Kenneth Christiansen. Christiansen had a military background as a paratrooper and worked as a flight attendant for Northwest Orient. He had some similarities to the physical description of Cooper, such as smoking and a fondness for bourbon. However, the FBI did not consider Christiansen a prime suspect due to inconsistencies in physical descriptions and a lack of direct evidence. Bryant, Jack Coffold, a con man and ex-convict, claimed to be Cooper and attempted to sell his story to a Hollywood production company. While his appearance resembled the composite drawings of Cooper, the FBI concluded that his account differed from undisclosed information, suggesting it was a fabrication. Lynn Doyle L. D. Cooper, proposed as a suspect by his niece, had a mysterious incident involving walkie-talkies and a bloody shirt on the day of the hijacking. However, there was no evidence linking him directly to the crime, and his fascination with a comic book character named Dan Cooper did not necessarily indicate his involvement with skydiving. Barbara Dayton, a recreational pilot and transgender woman, claimed to have staged the hijacking as a way to retaliate against the airline industry and the FAA. However, she later recanted her story, and her physical description did not closely match the eyewitness accounts. William Pratt Gossett, a military veteran with jump training experience, was obsessed with the Cooper case and claimed to have the missing ransom money. However, there was no concrete evidence linking him to the crime, and his whereabouts at the time of the hijacking could not be reliably established. Joe Lackage, a retired U.S. Army major and Korean War veteran, had experienced a tragic loss when his daughter Susan Jiff was killed due to a failed hostage negotiation by the FBI. This incident would go on to serve as a cautionary tale for hostage negotiators for years to come. Lakich and his wife took legal action against the FBI, and after a lengthy legal battle, an appeals court ruled in their favor, recognizing the FBI's negligence during the hostage negotiation. Lakich's connection to the infamous Cooper hijacking emerged when it was discovered that the hijacker's tie contained microscopic particles of rare metals, including unalloyed titanium. Given Lakich's previous work as a production supervisor in an electronics capacitor factory, where he would have been exposed to such materials, he became a suspect in the investigation. It was speculated that Lakich's motive for the hijacking may have been his anger towards the FBI for their failure to save his daughter. Another individual who drew attention as a potential suspect was John Emil List, an accountant and war veteran who committed a heinous act of murdering his wife, children and mother. List disappeared after the murders, withdrawing a significant amount of money from his mother's bank account. The timing of his disappearance, along with similarities to the hijacker's description, led the Cooper Task Force to consider him as a suspect. However, List consistently denied any involvement in the hijacking and the FBI no longer considers him a suspect. Theodore Ernest Mayfield, a Special Forces veteran and skydiving enthusiast, also came under scrutiny early in the investigation. Mayfield had a troubled history, having been convicted of negligent homicide and being indirectly responsible for multiple skydiving deaths. His prior dispute with an FBI agent further raised suspicions. However, Mayfield was eventually ruled out as a suspect when it was discovered that he had reached out to the FBI shortly after the hijacking to offer advice on skydiving practices and local skydivers. Richard McCoy, an Army veteran and helicopter pilot, gained attention for his involvement in a copycat hijacking. He demanded parachutes and a large sum of money before bailing out of the aircraft. McCoy was later apprehended and sentenced to prison but he managed to escape briefly before being killed in a shootout with FBI agents. Some individuals believed that McCoy was also the infamous Cooper, citing similarities between the two hijackings. However, the FBI dismissed this theory due to discrepancies in age, 
skydiving skills and evidence placing McCoy elsewhere during the Cooper hijacking. In 2022, independent researcher Eric Ulis put forward Vincent C. Peterson as a person of interest. Ulis discovered rare titanium antimony alloy particles on Cooper's tie, which led him to Peterson, who had worked at a company manufacturing such alloys. This revelation sparked further investigation into Peterson's potential involvement. Sheridan Peterson, a Marine Corps veteran and Boeing employee, was also considered a suspect due to his experience as a smoke jumper and physical resemblance to the Cooper description. Peterson often toyed with the media, teasing them about his possible connection to the hijacking. However, DNA analysis later cleared him of any involvement. Robert Wesley Rackstraw, a retired pilot and ex-convict with a military background, caught the attention of the Cooper task force when he was arrested on unrelated charges. Rackstraw attempted to fake his own death and was later found with forged pilot certificates. Investigators noted his resemblance to composite sketches of Cooper, but he was eventually eliminated as a suspect due to a lack of direct evidence. In recent years, new evidence has emerged, including a parachute strap and a confession letter, reigniting speculation about Rackshaw's involvement. Walter R. Riquet, a former military paratrooper and intelligence operative, was brought into suspicion as a potential hijacker by his friend Carl Lauren in 2018. Lauren had recorded a phone call in 2008 where Riquet claimed to be the hijacker. Ricard had given Lauren permission to share his story after his death and had allowed their phone conversations about the crime to be taped. During these conversations, Ricard provided details about his version of the hijacking and even confessed to his niece, Lisa's story. Lauren, using Ricard's description of the terrain on his way to the drop zone, concluded that Ricard had landed near Cleoloom, Washington. Lauren then found Jeff Osiadax, a dump truck driver who had encountered a stranger at a roadside cafe near Cleolum on the night of the hijacking. Osiadax had given directions to the cafe over the phone as requested by the stranger. Lauren convinced Joe Koenig, a former member of the Michigan State Police, of Rakaz's guilt, leading Koenig to publish a book on Cooper titled, Getting the Truth, I am D.B. Cooper. However, these claims have been met with skepticism. Cleolome is far from Flight 305's known flight path and the assumed drop zone. Rakaz's background as a military paratrooper and experienced skydiver contradicts the FBI's profile of an amateur skydiver. Additionally, Rakaz did not resemble the composite portrait assembled by the FBI. The FBI declined to comment on specific tips, but stated that no evidence had proven the culpability of any suspect beyond a reasonable doubt. In November 2018, The Orgonian published an article proposing William J. Smith, a World War II veteran from Bloomfield, New Jersey, as a suspect. Smith had a grudge against the corporate establishment and transportation field due to the loss of his pension during the Penn Central Transportation Company's bankruptcy. Smith's naval aviation and railroad experience were believed to have provided him with the knowledge necessary for the hijacking. The article also noted similarities between Smith and the FBI sketches of Cooper. The FBI did not comment on tips related to Smith. Another suspect proposed was Dwayne L. Weber, a World War II Army veteran with a criminal background. Weber's widow Joe claimed that he confessed to being Dan Cooper three days before his death in 1995. She discovered notations in Max Gunther's book about Cooper in her husband's handwriting. However, the FBI eliminated Weber as an active suspect due to his fingerprints not matching those processed in the hijacked plane and no other direct evidence was found to implicate him. While Cooper was one of the first to attempt air piracy for personal gain, there were other hijackings in 1972 that were inspired by his apparent success. These hijackings, including those by Richard Charles Lapointe, Richard McCoy Jr., Frederick Honeman, Rob Hetty and Martin McNally, were all unsuccessful. The incidence of hijackings dropped dramatically after the implementation of universal luggage searches in 1973. The next notable Cooper imitator was Glenn K. Tripp in 1980, who seized Northwest Orient Flight 608 at Seattle-Tacoma Airport. Tripp was apprehended after a 10-hour standoff. He attempted to hijack the same flight again in 1983, but was shot and killed by FBI agents when the plane landed in Portland. Despite the implementation of the Federal Sky Marshal Program the previous year, there were 31 hijackings in U.S. airspace in 1972 with 19 of them being for the purpose of extorting money. Out of the extortion cases, 15 hijackers also demanded parachutes. 
In response, the FAA mandated that airlines search all passengers and their bags, leading to legal challenges regarding Fourth Amendment rights. However, federal courts ruled that these searches were acceptable when conducted universally and limited to weapons and explosives. In 1973, only two hijackings occurred, both by psychiatric patients. One hijacker, Samuel Bike, had intentions to crash the plane into the White House to assassinate President Nixon. As a result of numerous copycat hijackings in 1972, the FAA required all Boeing 727 aircraft to be equipped with a spring-loaded device called the Cooper Vane. This device prevented the lowering of the aft air stair during flight. It consisted of an aluminum blade mounted on a pivot, automatically rotating into position at flight speeds to prevent the door from being opened. Additionally, peepholes were mandated in all cockpit doors to enable the crew to observe passengers without opening the door. In 1978, the hijacked 727-100 aircraft was sold to Piedmont Airlines and later purchased by Key Airlines in 1984. It was incorporated into the Air Force's civilian charter fleet for transportation during the F-117 Nighthawk development program. Eventually, the aircraft was scrapped for parts in a Memphis aircraft boneyard in 1996. On April 23, 2013, Earl J. Cossey, who packed the parachutes for Cooper, was found dead in his home in Woodenville, Washington. His death was ruled a homicide, but there was no evidence linking it to the Cooper case. Authorities believed it was most likely a burglary. Despite being labelled a rotten sleazy crook by Himmelsbach, Cooper's audacious crime inspired a cult following, leading to songs, films and literature. The Pacific Northwest embraced the Cooper legend, with novelty shops selling merchandise and establishments hosting Cooper-themed events. The Ariel General Store and Tavern held an annual Cooper Day celebration since 1974, except for 2015 when the owner passed away. In recent years, a Cooper Con convention has been established in Seattle, Washington. Founded by Cooper researcher Eric Ulys in 2018, it brings together researchers and enthusiasts to discuss the case. Originally held in Vancouver, Washington, the convention moved to Seattle in 2023 replacing the former D.B. Cooper Days event that ended with the closure of the Ariel Store pub after the owner's death. To this day, the D.B. Cooper hijacking remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the modern era.